everyone. Uh, my name is Pratik Rachaudhary, and I'm one of the product managers in, at Juniper uh, in the Contrail team. So the topic of discussion today is cloud network automation using Contrail. And the reason I did not want to choose something like SDN is because uh, I wanted to talk about more of the cust customer problems that we are trying to solve uh, using Contrail. So solving the networking challenges that are there in cloud environments and enabling that through APIs, through automation, and so on. Now, before I start, uh, the product is completely open sourced. So it's available uh, under Apache V2 license. And uh, you might have already probably visited uh, our website, opencontrail.org. There are tons of information. There are blogs and videos, as well as there is a day one book there about the architecture itself. So please feel free to go to that website some, at some point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the, uh, the product overview. And then um, I've got 30 minutes. I'm going to talk about uh, some of the customer use cases as well. Um, so before I start off, let me sort of tee it up with what are the requirements that we see from our customers in terms of uh, uh, the cloud network uh, automation. So uh, all, all, our, all our customers across uh, the, the board, whether it is enterprises, uh, service providers, or uh, you know, cloud SaaS companies, emerging companies, they have multiple heterogeneous environments that they want to interconnect. So they have the traditional environment, which is uh, mostly VMware based. There's VLAN architecture. Then there is they are building out their next generation, you know, spine and leaf, class based data center, and they are building multiple of those. Uh, and these data centers will have uh, virtual machines, containers. I mean, containers is becoming very popular with financial services uh, because of performance reasons. Then they, are, they will also have bare metal servers and storage. Again, if you want to run Hadoop clusters and so on, you need bare metal. And then there'll be like other uh, service appliances, physical service appliances, whether physical load balancers, physical firewalls, and virtualized instances of those. All these in their multiple distributed data centers. There will be public clouds, uh, Amazon or uh, Google or, or Azure, as well as service providers are themselves building public clouds. And there is the customer uh, branch uh, as well, the customer, the, the enterprise branch. All of these need to actually interconnect with each other. So the requirements that we see from, uh, from customers are, you know, first of all, legacy interconnect. How do you connect your traditional uh, data center with your modern uh, next generation data centers? How do you do P plus V interconnect? How do you connect your virtual machines, containers with bare metal servers within the same network? How do you do multi-DC distributed cloud, essentially stretching a network from one data center to another? So creating a network where you know, VMs in two data centers can seamlessly talk to each other. Uh, P plus V service chaining. This is very important. Service chaining is an important concept in the telco world where you want to create a chain of services, whether load balancers, firewalls, and so that when traffic goes from one network to another, it goes through that sequence. And how do you have your physical network functions, like physical firewalls as well as virtual firewalls in the same service chain? Uh, and then there is hybrid cloud, of course. 70% I mean, of enterprises are uh, planning to use uh, some sort of a hybrid cloud uh, over the next few years. And branch networking. So essentially, how do you connect all of these with your CP environment? So that's where you know, Contrail comes in and brings in the cloud uh, uh, cloud network automation. And of course, you have to have an automated environment on top of that to manage, manage, manage and orchestrate it. So with that background, uh, let me start talking about the product itself. Here is a high-level architecture of Contrail, uh, very, very standard architecture. There is a centralized, logically centralized controller, which is actually physically distributed. It con consists of multiple nodes, as you can see there. There are control nodes, config nodes, analytics nodes. And they, the con control nodes east-west talk BGP. Uh, that's how they federate among themselves. And that's how you can get control plane scalability. There is a data plane component called vRouter, which is a kernel loadable module, which sits within, the, within, the, uh, within each host. So every host has got uh, a vRouter in it. The other set of uh, uh, elements that the control controller talks to is a top of rack switch. And we heard about you know, how, uh, how a Contrail controller in many scenarios want to have a bare metal server as part of a virtual network. So that, in that context, we actually talk to the top of rack switch. We use the OVSDB protocol uh, because we want to make it multi-vendor, because QFX 5100 supports OVSDB. 
Uh, and that's how you can have like a virtual network, let's say a blue virtual network or a red virtual network, within which you can have bare metal servers as well as VMs, as well as uh, you know, containers. And physical servers can be service chained as well. Yeah, uh, that's right. That's right. But that's that's, uh, that's we do physical service chaining using using MX. Okay. Uh, Are you using the standard hardware VTAP schema for OVSDB? Yes. Rock on. Yes. Thank you. So, and, and then the other thing that the control controller peers with is a gateway. Is it's the MX MX gateway in in our case? But that's the that's where all the tunnels <laughs> terminate, and you can go out to the internet or or a VLAN environment. Now the important thing here is that, of course, we support multiple, uh, you know, overlay uh, protocols, uh, GRE, UDP, VXLAN. Uh, but but the but the important thing to note here is that again we do it in a very multi-vendor fashion because we want to give customers freedom of choice. So whether we are talking about different Linux distributions, you know, Ubuntu, CentOS, Red Hat, what have you, or hypervisors, we integrate with KVM, uh, ESXi, for example, uh, uh, or different kinds of x86 servers, or different types of gateways, uh, MX in our case, but again, it's talking standard protocol, so uh, you can have other gateways, or top of racks, which again, we talk OVSDB standard protocol, um, or orchestrators. So we talk to multiple environments, and in fact, you can also have different kinds of uh, VNFs, virtual network functions also as, as part of service chain, not just the ones that are provided by Juniper, but also by third party uh, vendors. So the whole environment is made very multi-vendor. Now, um, one of the things that I will draw parallels to, to understand the architecture, is its likeness to a router. So if you look at the control nodes, they are like the routing engine of a router. They talk east-west, they talk BGP. The, the compute nodes can be thought of as line cards. And when we talk about uh, the QFX 5100, uh, there's, there's one use case I'm going to talk about. You can think of the QFX 5100 as another line card in this, in this um, framework. And you think of this whole thing as a giant router chassis. Uh, you've got config nodes uh, in a router. There are CLI or other methods. That's how you do the configuration. And you can have you know, orchestrations, other orchestration systems. So just, just if you want to draw a mental picture of the architecture, you can actually think a router. Now. Um, the features of Contrail, uh, there, are, there are lots of features. I've just highlighted a summary of all the features. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about a few of them in a little more detail because I've got uh, uh, very limited time. Uh, so of course, there is routing and switching. There are VRFs and uh, EVPN instances that are created within the vRouter. Uh, there is, we support all the you know, IPAM, DNS, DHCP, source NAT, floating IP, which is uh, equivalent to elastic IP in the Amazon case, um, uh, Amazon Web Services. IPv6 uh, is something that we support in the overlay as well, and quality of service also. Uh, we do load balancing within the vRouter itself, because there are multiple paths that traffic can take, and we do ECMP load balancing there. Uh, there is, uh, within the vRouter itself, we do some form of distributed firewall. We don't have ALGs and all that, but just uh, uh, creating stateful policies is something that we do within the vRouter itself. So you can, for example, say that uh, allow or deny HTTP traffic between these two virtual networks, and that is all done in a very distributed fashion. In fact, all of these are done in a distributed fashion because they are being done within the vRouter, which is distributed itself. And you uh, said it is stateful. Yes, it is stateful. And that all is performance if? It, it, yeah, so performance is, we have, uh, we have actually tested on a 10 gig interface to be 9.1 gig on, on a 10 gig interface. So it, it is de definitely performant. Uh, third party network services, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Uh, this is one use case I'm going to talk again in the context of uh, the customer use cases. But the next few things, uh, analytics is, is one of the key differentiators of the product. So we have got rich analytics where you know, everything that is done within the vRouter is sent back to the analytics node, and it is presented as REST APIs to uh, any kind of visualization tools or even uh, a Contrail web UI that, 
shows everything. So just just a few snapshots of the product. Uh, again, you can you can go to our website and you can get more information about it. But a few things like you can get more detailed information about any of the different nodes, whether it is the compute node, control node, and so on. You can in fact look at live traffic between two virtual networks by spinning up a Wireshark instance. So you can just do a port mirroring, send it to a Wireshark instance, and essentially look at that real traffic that is going between two virtual networks. You can also query the system for either historical flows or for historical flows uh, essentially between two virtual networks what have been the flows at different points in time so those are all the capabilities that you can do on the web UI itself of course there are lots of API's and stuff that are available uh, and you can query the system to get a lot of information about about the product now one of the other interesting things that we are doing is the overlay underlay correlation where uh, what we do is um, uh, and this is whenever we talk about this to customers, they get excited because it helps them do troubleshooting. Uh, essentially, what you can do is you can uh, do a topology discovery uh, using LLDP and SNMP queries. And once you do the topology discovery, again, this is a very simplified gloss uh, fabric that we have shown, like oversimplified one. Once you do the topology discovery, you can visually look at uh, active flows as well as historical flows, what underlay paths a particular overlay flow has taken. All of that can be done using IPFIX S flow information from the from the different routers. In real time as well? In not, real not, time not as well as historical. Sure. Both as of well these as, you can do. Okay. So you can basically do active flows as well as you can search for uh, previous flows between two. And two you can export the PCAP or Exactly, you like. can actually do that. So so all of, all of this functionality is, um, is, is the part of the analytics feature which differentiates us from, from several, of the, several of the other vendors. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to quickly talk about is service chaining and the way we do service chaining, why it makes it a very multi-vendor kind of a fashion. So in, a, in, in the logical world, you basically define a policy. You say that, you know, let's say I have two virtual networks, red and green, and I want to service chain them with, let's say, two instances, a firewall and a, and a DPI. Right? So in the, in the actual physical you know, policy enforcement phase, what happens is there are all these you know, VRFs that are created uh, within, within the vRouter on all the hosts. So for simplicity, I've assumed that all of these are running on different hosts, but they can run in, in any combination. So if you, if you look at the way we do service chaining, if the red virtual network R1 is trying to talk to the green virtual network G1, uh, it sends out a packet. And uh, once it reaches the vRouter, the vRouter looks up this table and says, OK, if I need to send to G1, my next hop is going to be server S2 with a label L3. So IP Fabric forwards it to server S2, and every interface has a label, and so it gets forwarded to that label. Again, when packet comes out on the other side, it looks up, destination is still G1. My next hop is going to be server S3 with label L5. And that's how it ends up at server S3 on the left interface of the, of the service. So now if you look, look at the way we have done service chaining here, it is, uh, we have not modified anything in the service itself. There is no unique packet that is going inside that. We strip off everything when we send the traffic. So we do service chaining using routing. And that is what makes it a very multi-vendor in nature because if you don't like this from a particular vendor, you can yank it out, put something in its place, and that should work. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing is that these services can also scale out horizontally. Uh, so you can have multiple instances of those, and that's when the vRouter ECMP load balancing also kind of kicks in, right? So, yes. Oh, so you you mentioned to Larry. So if you if you have physical, this is for virtual. This is for virtual instances of devices. Yes. So if you have physical, let me IPS or whatever you have that coming up. Let me actually answer that. So that is something that we uh, can do manually. What we are doing is we are automating that using netconf to the MX. The only the way we do physical service chaining is imagine this was a physical uh, firewall, and imagine this being instead of a vRouter, it's an MX. So we just stick it to the MX, and that's that's the only difference. Everything else, the constructs, whatever the, whatever we do within a service chain, exactly remains the same. So this V router is replaced with an MX, and that's how you can seamlessly do service chaining. You can do it with some virtual. Yes, devices, exactly. Some physical devices going up to the that's MX, right. back down. Yeah, they're probably but, just hardware-based VTEPs that you, I'm assuming, right on the MX. So MX, yeah, you create yeah. create these VRFs. 
exactly as you do in, in case of a virtual uh, instance. You create these VRFs, and that's how it actually goes from one interface to the other. So just if visually, if you replace this thing with an MX, where you tie the uh, physical instance, that's how you actually can do it. And going back to what you said, because of the way that your service chain is based on route, right, which is why physical theoretically is no different than virtual. That's right. That's exactly. So you're just changing a route. If I put another firewall in or some type of inspection that it needs to go through on the way out or in, I, I can manipulate with that that with that the service right. chain because it's just a route. You're not that tagging right. the traffic or anything. That's right. That's gotcha. absolutely right. Okay, so um, let's move on to use cases. Now, um, I've put in three broad use cases. I've, I've bucketized the use cases in three broad segments. One is the cloud services, uh, SaaS, SaaS companies, cloud emerging companies, as well as many of the enterprises have their cloud teams who are kind of focusing on this. These are uh, some set of customers. In fact, uh, we have, um, we, th these are some which we have been public with. We have done some joint sessions at some of the uh, summits as well. Um, there, is, there are a bunch of other companies which we have not disclosed yet. For example, a large industrial internet enterprise, they are essentially doing um, vCenter integration. So they have a vCenter environment and they want to integrate uh, Contrail with vCenter. Um, so so the whole idea about the cloud services is that you can launch VMs, containers, uh, you have to. You can basically create security policies between those virtual networks. Uh, you, you can use service chaining if needed, uh, as well as you know you can do automation using you know Heat, which is OpenStack based, or different kinds of orchestration systems. In fact, uh, uh, an LA-based gaming company they have got uh, Docker containers and they have their own orchestration system, and so we have integrated with them as well. We have done um, some basic integration. Again, you'll find this uh, video on OpenContrail.org as well. We've done some proof of concept integration with Kubernetes uh, as well. I was just going to ask about that actually, because um, it imposes a networking model with the pods concept, mm -hmm. a right. layer three boundaries and whatnot. Right. How do you how do you um, uh, you interoperate with that? What, do, you, do you override any of that functionality? So we have, what we have done is we have created a plugin for the API server uh -huh. so that it goes and talks to the Contrail controller. Okay. And the kubelets as well, we have made some modifications to that. So instead of using IP tables, it goes and talks to the V router. Okay, so you actually are owning that part of the pod model. That's right. So awesome. each pod can be thought of as a virtual network in, cool. in our case. Sweet. That's cool. So, we, I mean, that, that, that particular uh, demo video is available on opencontrail.org if you are, and, and, the, and one of our architects, Pedro Marquez, has written a blog detailing about what implementation is. Very cool, done. thank so, you. So, again, the, one of our customers um, wanted this, so we just did, a, did some kind of a proof of concept just with them. So the IPAM, I keep going on this because, mm -hmm. I mean, the, I know, but the IPAM, DNS, THCP, is this your version or is this a vendor version? whatever my flavor of IPAM solution I want, or is Good. it either in, or? In the absence of, any, uh, let's say, an external DHCP server, you can use uh, the vRouter acts as a proxy. Sure. For, for the for the. I'm more interested, honestly, I keep going back to this, is right. the IPAM part. Right. Is so you can, for example, integrate with uh, an external uh, IPAM server. But do you have your own as well that I could use as part of this? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. So the next set of use cases are uh, bare metal as a service. I mean, very applicable to you know hosting companies, but uh, essentially a large APAC-based telco is using this. Essentially, they are uh, offering bare metal as a service. And in, in that context, we are working very closely with QFX uh, to deliver the solution to the uh, end customer. Uh, again, there are bare metal servers. You want to uh, actually connect them. Uh, bare metal servers part of different virtual networks. You want to interconnect them using policies. Um, as, uh, and, and again, overlay underlay correlation also falls in that category. The third is the uh, tel mostly focused on the telco side, whether it's service chaining, creating a telco cloud, creating SD-WAN, which is, which is the uh, some people call it VCP, UCP, so creating that SD-WAN environment where you do customer branch networking in a proper way. And so again, there also we have got a bunch of customers. One of them we have done a joint session with is NTT, 
so they have got, uh, we, have, we have worked with them and co-created a model where uh, you can do the, you know, the call home, you can do the initial provisioning of the lightweight CP device, as well as can do a service chaining where services are running on the CP device itself. So all of that is falls under the, the third category. Now, um, le let me just give you one example, uh, and then I'm going to talk about on the cloud services, and then I'm going to talk about what we are doing on the, on the bare metal ho hosting side. So uh, uh, this is, again, uh, cl this is basically uh, uh, derived from a customer, CloudWatt. Uh, what they have is an infrastructure which they have created where there are, you know, compute network storage and some of the, you know, AAA metering kind of things. Uh, they have created this using Contrail and um, OpenStack. And they have essentially exposed APIs to this. So, of course, Contrail, Contrail has got um, uh, all the components of Contrail has got APIs. And those APIs are being used by their backend servers as well as by their, you know, um, their applications and uh, front end uh, systems. So, wh what we have essentially done is, and this is where, you know, automation and APIs come into the picture. What we have essentially done is we have let our customers expose APIs to their systems using this, this particular infrastructure. Uh, everything is, again, as you can see, API driven. So, this is uh, basically one of our customers who wants to offer infrastructure service, uh, services to their uh, end customers. The second uh, example is where we do um, bare, metal as a uh, bare metal as a service, BMS Tor integration. So the, what we have done is, you, you uh, remember the architecture of Contrail where there is, a, there is a logically centralized, physically distributed controller, and it has got different nodes, compute nodes, config nodes. We have added another node there, which we are calling as a Tor service node. And logically, it is, it is part of the controller, but it also uh, it runs on a separate x86 server, which has got a V router in it. And what it does is it takes XMPP commands and converts them to OVSDB, and that's how it talks to the top of rack switches. Uh, and then uh, it, there, there are AVPN, um, so it peers with the, with, with the router uh, talking AVPN. And so you can have VXLAN tunnels, which uh, essentially in, in cases where there are VLANs, it terminates on the top of rack. In cases there, where there are V routers, it actually terminates on the V router itself. And uh, it, the, there's one that terminates here, uh, handles mostly bomb traffic, and uh, one that terminates on the, on the MX. So um, now what it enables our customers to do is uh, what you see on the right hand side. If you follow one of those lines, let's say you follow the red line, again, uh, from going from a VM to another VM, Contrail actually takes care of it through the vRouter. But when you want to go from, let's say, a VM to a bare metal server in the same network, it actually goes through the top of rack switch. There is a bridge domain, and as, as was mentioned before, you know, VLANs and the VXLAN tunnel ends there, so you can do a uh, switch. When VM needs to go to a bare metal server on the, on the blue network, so from you're traversing the green network to a blue network, as well as you're traversing from VM to a bare metal uh, environment, that is when it goes through uh, an L3 gateway. So this is basically what we have enabled for our customers. And as I was mentioning before, if you think of it again in terms of uh, a router, the QFX 5100 is another line card there with bare metal servers now as, as hanging from there. Okay, and then uh, there is another use case. This is a use case which is applicable, which again, this, this is modeled after whatever we have done for uh, NTT. And it was a, again, a co-creation model where they developed a bunch of pieces, like for example, you know, billing and charging, some of the centralized portal, they build it out because uh, our focus is coming in when we want to do the networking part of it, right? So uh, again, there are multiple requirements of this. First of all, you need to make sure that this CP device, which is a lightweight x86 server, can, um, can be provisioned, can be instantiated, uh, and so on. Um, then you have got services that needs to be, and this, this is again, uh, in, in the case of NTT, it was a Atom-based lightweight x86 server. Um, it's basically there are VMs running here within within the CP device, as as well as um, there are services running within the data center, right? And the way we look at this whole thing is that 
This for us is nothing but another compute node, another x86 server. So all we need to do is figure out how to connect this V router to that to the data center or uh, CO or POP or what have you. And once it's done, it's just as another uh, x86 server running a V router in it. It sends all the analytics information. You can do service chaining where services can reside on the CPU device as well as it can reside in the data center. So um, all of those are available analytics and then um, you know, service chaining as I was talking about. And one other uh, important thing that they wanted uh, us to do was an internet breakout, which we did within the vRouter itself because customers from the CPU device can actually go out. So this is, again, as I mentioned, was modeled after um, uh, Entity i3, which we did. And we did a presentation on that. There is, there is a video on this available as well. Um, and then finally, I know I'm uh, running um, close to the uh, top of my hour. Uh, this is basically a list of all the videos that we have. A uh, bunch of them are there on opencontrail.org already. And you can uh, take a look at them. Uh, there are lots of use cases. There are lots of um, demos that are part of those. So please feel free to take a look at it. A quick question, just yes. on the virtual layer, in terms of how the vRouter is built. Mm -hmm. um, are you re are you reusing any components, kernel or otherwise, uh, from OVS, or is that totally? No. Totally so your own? yes, it's it's totally separate. So it's a it's a component that we have developed. Mm -hmm. It uh, so our concept was L three is is first. That's what we started off with, and then we had L two features on top of it. So it was. It's not reusing any of the OVS features. It's a new component that we have developed. You're not even reusing the OVS kernel module for data path manipulation or anything like no, that. No. Yeah. Okay. So what are you doing instead? So um, I, I'll, I'll defer that to uh, Harsha. Sure, I was curious, like how? Because a lot of people, what they do is they say all the user space processes we're writing those ourselves. Mm -hmm, we'll mm -hmm. reuse the kernel module because, of course, that's totally different. But you know, some so, I guess you haven't done that. So vRouter itself is a is a kernel module that we actually so, so put in. Done is so what we have done is uh, we have made sure that we have implemented the full uh, L3 VPN um, forwarding model in the which was not existent. So it's pretty much like what happens in Amex. We have it in a kernel module. Uh, so that's why we needed to do. So today, if you see the implementation that people are doing for DVR, for example, so there is an OVS that does L2, then the Linux host does the uh, layer 3, and there is a lot of context switches back, back and forth. And then there is a IP tables that are doing uh, uh, filtering. Sure. And that causes a lot of latencies, performance issues. So what we did is we since we came from our networking DNA, we wanted to build something that is uh, like integrated routing and switching and ACLs which are integrated into a pipeline. Okay. So that's why we rebuilt the whole uh, L3 VPN data path. And so it does uh, floatable lookup just for the ACLs part. And it does uh, VRF and uh, route lookup with uh, the next stop architecture. Uh, so that doesn't exist in uh, kernel, so we built it uh, completely ourselves. The reason uh, we built it ourselves because we wanted to support multiple uh, OSs. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to. So, uh, so when we started off, so right now we are we have most traction in Linux, but we also have a FreeBSD port, and we also wanted to take the same model mm -hmm. uh, in Hyper-V at some point of time. Mm -hmm. So that's why we built our own module. Okay. Did any of that get upstreamed? I actually don't know the history behind that. Did you so, guys no, so contribute that back? So it's not been uh, upstreamed, but it is all open source. Okay. Cool. That was going to be my question. Yeah. Too. Is yeah, it open source. It, That's the main source. reason why people reuse OVS because, right. uh, well, I mean, obviously you take on your own work, but it's just so hard to get that done for obvious reasons. Yeah. Yep. So just that's why I wanted to ask. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah.